Hello and welcome to Inside Bets. Coming up on the show today, Amina heads over to the university's treehouse space. We then take a look at another presenter versus presenter. Then finally, journalism student Ines got to talk with Lord David Willets before his lecture at the university this week. Great stuff. First, let's go over to the treehouse. The Treehouse is an organisation catering for the students of the University of Bedfordshire, which is caring and warming and relaxing environment. The students can come and socialise with each other, taking a break for uni life. I'm here at the University of Bedfordshire's Treehouse. As you can see, it looks lovely. And this is the Globe Cafe, where you will have special food, games and activities. So, let's go have a look. Today's event in the Global Café, which brings international students together with the UK students to interact with each other throughout the games and activities. So I'm here with Sue today. Hello Sue. Hello. Thank you so much for letting me talk to you for today. Oh, so no tell problem. us a bit about yourself. Uh, well, I'm an assistant chaplain here in the Treehouse. I'm here to support students in lots of different ways. So often I'm here during the daytime just to welcome people or um, if they need a little bit of support, I'm here to support them too. So that might be just a listening ear and a cup of tea. And it's for all students. It's well open to everybody. And basically we have um, nice drinks and snacks um, to, to have while you're here. And we play games and we chat and we get to know one another. Tell us why do you think the students um, should come here? Well, I think it's a place of community. We're, we're called Community and Faith, and that's what we're about. Um, so you don't have to have a faith of any kind to come here. We're about building community. So people can come here to make new friends, to meet people from all over the world, students from all over the world. I can see the atmosphere is amazing here, isn't it? Yeah, Everyone talking, yeah, not bad, meeting, not and the food, of course. I think that's the only thing I'm talking about right now. <laughs> food seems to be coming up quite a lot. It doesn't but it? it's a really important part yeah. of family and community, so yeah. that's what we're about. So I'm here with Sam today. Hello, Sam. Hello, Thank everyone. you for coming along, for having a little bit of a chatty time. Yeah, Tell us a bit about yourself. Uh, I'm Sam. Okay. I'm a full-time teacher in one of the Stevney secondary schools, but I come here on Tuesday uh, as one of the assistant chaplains to help uh, with the um, Globe Cafe. Do you want to teach us a bit of a bongo? Yeah, that would be good. Let's do this. Oh, yeah. All right. Okay, yeah. Just going to put the mic back here. Okay. You ready? Yeah. All right, teach me something. Okay. Go on. You taught me so much. Do you think yeah, we can do it again? Yeah. Perfect. And there we have it, guys. Thank you so much. And thank you, Sam. So, as you can see, this place is full of atmosphere, enthusiasm, and great peace. So, if you guys want to come along here, meet new friends, talk to people, then this is the place to be. You can also check us on the website, which is www.tree-house.org.uk. See you guys later. Thank you, Amina. If you've seen previous episodes of Inside Beds, then you know that each week we put two of our presenters against one another in simple student games to find out who is the best student. Uh, currently, it's 2-0 to Ryan. Can Siobhan pull it back? Well, let's find out. Okay, I can see you're having quite a bit of trouble there. Yeah, I am. I'm Let's, but I'll show you with all three pieces. So you get your cable, you put it in, the whole way down to the end of the teeth, clip it in, and then you hold the, in your case, the black thing. Come on, give it a practice, have, uh... and then see how fast you can get it going. Yeah, the black thing's not going to go in with it. <laughs> okay, recording. Okay, so we're going to get a count in, please, from set. Five, four, three, two... One. <laughs> I mean, that's one round to me. Siobhan put the wrong bit in the box there. Okay, cool. Can we get another count in? One nil to me. Let's make it two nil. All right. 
five, four, three, two, one. First Luna! successful. I mean, they're not touching. Luna. And it looks like yours is slowing down. Even with interference. Look at that. Two now. That's a white one. So that's a hundred percent success rate for me. All right. And zero for you. <laughs> Thanks. Turns out she can't, but congratulations again to Ryan. Currently it's 3-0. Someone has to knock him off his perch next week. Soon we won't be able to fit him on screen anymore. Maybe I should give it a try. Anyways, finally we head over to Vice Chancellor's office to talk with House of Lords member and conservative politician David Willits ahead of his lecture in post-grad center next week. Hello, I'm Inej and this is Adrian Leibovitz. We are here interviewing Lord David Willits, who is here to give a lecture of, about the intergenerational contract. So you have said that the uh, increase in access of women to education has uh, actually widened the social gap. And you have also said that although education is a positive thing, it does not always have a positive impact on social mob mobility. Do you think that it is possible to have uh, an improvement in education that actually also improves social mobility and that doesn't exclude the poorest? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, I should just say, I am in favor of opportunities for women. I'm not against opportunities for women. But in education policy, as in the rest of life, good and bad can be all mingled in together. And it does look as if what happened, at least at first, was as how education expanded, the, one of the groups that took most advantage of this expansion was uh, daughters from middle class families. You know, fantastic, good for them. But uh, that's where the growth was, much more than in boys or girls from poorer backgrounds. And then if you add in this, this phenomenon that the social, sociologists call assortative mating, where the well-educated women marry the well-educated men, and if you man measure inequality by household incomes, not individual incomes, that is one of the drivers of widening inequality, paradoxically. So I wasn't saying good or bad, I was just reporting honestly on what I think is a social trend. So what you can do for the future is it's the argument for continuing to increase the number of people going to university. Because we have reached close to saturation now in the young men and women from more affluent backgrounds. But from poorer backgrounds, we're still, you know, for the poorest 20%, uh, we're on 20% of them going to university, which is double what it was a decade ago, but is still not good enough. So you, you keep on expanding, you gradually bring in the more marginal groups. And going to university is still a fantastic opportunity for people and it isn't a guarantee, but it does transform your life chances. Uh, your lecture is about the, the intergenerational contract and it's an issue that you have devoted a lot of attention to. Uh, what can older generations do to improve the future of younger generations? And do you think that it is possible to have a sustainable model when the demographic trends show that we are having an increasingly older population? I think it is possible to have a sustainable model and to do that, uh, I think the most important single practical thing that older people can do is not oppose new houses being built. Uh, and my experience as a constituency MP and perhaps uh, your vice chancellor's experience as a constituency MP was going to residents associations meetings where they wanted you above all to oppose new houses being built. Um, and often these were decent people but they were aged over 50 and they got a house of their own. I think that's one practical thing. A second thing is not to take out so much from the pensions pot that you don't leave behind good enough pensions for future generations. And that is partly an appeal to their altruism but it's also appealed to the mutual interest we have in the intergenerational contract. There's a great American bumper sticker 
be nice to your kids, they choose your nursing home. And that's a, even if you don't buy the argument you have a moral obligation, that's a good practical argument. What do you think the government is trying to achieve with the Higher Education and Research Bill? And do you have any concerns about this legislation? I would say what it's, what it's trying to achieve, accomplish, is to update the legal framework so that it matches the reality of higher education in Britain today. And we have, in reality, had an ed a regulator of higher education, the old Higher Education Funding Council, but its regulatory powers essentially came from the power of the purse. It used to put a lot of money into universities. Now the money that comes into universities, some of it's from overseas students, some of it's from the student loans company with providing the loans to cover students' fees, some of it's research, but there's little that comes from Hefke. And you, what you need is to replace the kind of implicit regulator using the power of the purse with an explicit regulatory function protecting the interests of students and the wider public interest, regardless of the exact amount of money that the university or higher education institution is receiving. Um, and I think that's necessary. I think it's overdue. One of my failures was I wish I'd been able to persuade my colleagues from both parties in the coalition that we should go ahead. But there was a bit of a reluctance to have more voting in the House of Commons on higher education in my time. Um, so uh, I think it's needed for that reason. There are risks. And part of the risk is that the old body, the Higher Education Funding Council, was trusted. And so although its legal basis for interfering, intervening, regulating, was kind of about 10 words in one clause, that it has the power to con attach conditions to grants. In reality, people trusted it to use that, to do that power well. Nobody quite knows how the OFS is going to set about it, which means that there are uh, you know, uh, people are, are kind of placing, there's a lot of anxiety as people are transferring their, their worries onto this new body. And that's, that's leading to a lots of amendments to the bill to try to define more clearly how it'll function. But it doesn't, at the moment, command trust. Right. Okay. What aspects of the work of the Houses of Parliament uh, would you like to see get greater publicity? Uh, and a better explanation in the media? Yeah, I think that, that, that Parliament does several different things, and it's interesting now looking at it from the perspective of the Lords and not the Commons. It, it's partly the place where anger, frustration, um, disappointment, you know, all the emotions that people feel about things that the government, as they see, is getting wrong, are expressed. And it's, I'd much more they're expressed within a democratic assembly than out on the streets. And sometimes when you, people see MPs or shouting at each other and everything, they say, well, that's not how the governing body of a university would behave, or it's not how the board of directors of a company would behave. But that, we're not at the executive body like that. We are not the cabinet. We are the place, we're much more like, I mean this, as a, in, as a praise, not criticism, we're much more like a debating society, uh, a mass meeting. So there's a misunderstanding that we are a kind of a decision-taking body. We're not, we're a place where these arguments are expressed. Um, and I think that's a very useful function. And that's above all you get in the Commons. You don't get much of that in the Lords. I think where the Lords is useful, and which is also not really appreciated, is a revising chamber. And the Higher Education Bill is a great example, because that went through committee stage, as it's called in the Commons, and to be honest, the government wasn't pressed much and it, it didn't face particularly expert challenges and queries. Uh, in the seven days of the committee stage in the House of Lords, it really did have former vice-chancellors, former ministers uh, from both parties, uh, other people who really, who really knew their stuff, pressing the government on detailed points about what the legislation would work in a way that had not been done in the Commons. So, uh, the Commons clearly is the, is the senior, more superior, but democratically legitimate body, but the Lords has got a useful function as well. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There we go. That's all we have time for, unfortunately, but join us next week for more exciting things happening around in Luton and Bedfordshire. See ya.